Ah, there we go. All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and call this committee to meet to order. Uh, this is the House Study Committee on Juvenile Court Judges. Um, right now, for the purpose, a lot of people have asked me the purpose of this first committee meeting. Uh, the first pur purpose, the, the main purpose of this first committee meeting is just to really kind of get a baseline on where we're at at juvenile court, uh, as far as our juvenile court judges are concerned, kind of getting the lay of the land. Uh, Deborah is going to talk briefly about kind of the funding formula and how that works. Uh, Deborah, for those of you who don't know Deborah, she works with ACCG, which is our county commission. Um, really well suited um, to address this issue. So she is the first off. We're going to follow. If anybody would like a copy of the agenda, feel free to. Um, I have a couple of extra copies, and Matt will be more than happy to provide those to you. Attending has any uh, questions or comments, please hold those until the end of the meeting. Uh, committee members, you are welcome to uh, question. I would encourage you to wait until the end of the presentation uh, that our presenters have, have prepared for us and then ask questions as many as you would like because we are trying to, to find out kind of what, what the lay of the land is as far as our juvenile court judges in uh, the state of Georgia. So Deborah, I'll... Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you committee members for inviting me here today to talk to you. Uh, we have long been partners with you, the legislature, in trying to shore up juvenile courts and uh, worked with you throughout the juvenile code rewrite and trying to fund that. And I know uh, Chairman Welch is not here, but he has generously helped us uh, in getting funding for both prosecutors and public defenders uh, in the juvenile courts that are state paid, uh, which really helped a lot as we transitioned into uh, the juvenile code rewrite. Uh, there are still issues, as many of you are aware, um, in the way that the juvenile court judgeships are created and allocated, and whether or not doing that by the number of superior court judges is really an appropriate way to manage those caseloads. Uh, and does that adequately reflect uh, what a judgeship need might be at a local level? Uh, the, the number of superior court judges. Uh, so we would really, we appreciate this committee coming together and we would really like to see you look at those type of issues. Uh, what are best practices around caseloads as it relates to juvenile court judges and their, and, and their caseloads? Um, is there a better way to determine what the appropriate number of juvenile court judges are for any given area? And the other thing we'd like to, really see the committee take a look at are the multi-county judicial circuits. Uh, I know that's a challenge for many of the juvenile court judges that, that have large judicial circuits that have big geographical areas. It's also a challenge for the local county governments to ascertain what is their appropriate share of those costs uh, and how is that fairly split up. Right now it's done by a variety of different ways. Uh, in different judicial circuits, and it's not only juvenile court, it's prosecutors, I mean, it's a number of different, anything that falls into that judicial circuit budget realm. But there really is not a good formula or way for counties to know whether or not they're paying their fair share. Is there one county taking on more of a load than some of the others? And so those are some of the things we'd like to see this committee look at. Back during the Juvenile Code rewrite, we did a, a good bit of research um, with the counties around juvenile court budgets and how those were allocated. They were all over the map, as you could imagine, uh, based on what counties paid and you know what they were asked to, to chip in, and there really is no rhyme or reason for that. Uh, it really didn't really get back to caseload. Uh, so we would like to see the legislature kind of take a look at what is an appropriate number of judges per caseload, and how do we fairly distribute the cost of juvenile court to all the counties within a multi-county judicial circuit. So again, I'd like to say thank you to the legislature. There has been a lot of funding uh, that has been put forth for programs at the community level, um, but we think that the, given the way that the juvenile code rewrite has set up the juvenile court system, it is more of a state system than it is a county system. The state's really driving more of those decisions than the counties are. And in those counties that have independent courts, the counties are uh, funding 100% of those costs in the independent courts. Uh, so we would like to see the state really 
step up to the plate and took a, take a look at what is a fair way to be true partners with the counties in the running of juvenile courts. Thank you, Deborah. Can you speak just a little bit about how that changed? You know, like what was what was the previous process? Um, because I think you know we're I'm trying to kind of start you know like as a baseline as far as how things have changed, what that dynamic is, and how that funding has changed. So can you speak a little bit to the you know specifically what the juvenile code rewrite did? How well, that changed put, the it, administration? Right. As of, as all of you know, it put a lot of really strict deadlines on juvenile court judges. Uh, however, there were no support staff allocated along with those additional administrative duties. Uh, and so that's one example is it takes a lot more uh, local court personnel to meet those deadlines um, and to make sure that they're hitting those, those, those marks um, and provide administrative support to the judges. Uh, we also had to have additional attorneys, uh, both for conflict cases for parents and for children. Uh, which increased the cost for attorneys in juvenile court uh, a large amount. And, and again, we appreciate the attorneys the state has provided, but the counties are still funding a good number of those positions. I have some data from back in 2014. We have not done an update to that study. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to offer you today to the study committee is as you move forward, if you want us to help you try to get information from the counties, that's more up to date so we can take a temperature and see where we are now that we're a few years in from implementation, we'll be more than happy to help you do that. Um, and then again, it's, and, and there is, I do hear from law enforcement uh, that there is an issue with some of the kids going in and coming right back out, going in, coming right back out, and, there's, and it's really becoming a public safety issue in some of our local communities uh, with, the, with the revolving door of the kids getting out and coming right back in. Um, so with that, I'll, I, I think the juvenile court judges certainly have a lot more up-to-date data, I would think, and can give you a better feel for how things are right now. Uh, but we want you to know we're willing to stand with you. We know how important uh, juvenile court caseload is, how important it is to not only those families but to the state as a whole. Uh, and so we're here to stand to be partners, but we want you to be a true partner and help us fund it. Thank you, Deborah. Um, and for those committee members who aren't as familiar um, as legislators with, with our lovely system up here, if you, there is a small button located to the right of your microphone, and if you just hit that, it starts flashing up here at the chairman's seat, um, and that's how I know that you would like to ask a question. So um, uh, anyway, so uh, Representative Reeves has a question. Hey, thank you, Deborah. Um, do you have a, what's the example of what a, a good, solid, strong, average caseload number per judge is and what is the outliers you said somewhere is disproportionate what is well, an I, example I, like of the outliers on I, that i have to be honest with you i don't know what the appropriate caseload mm -hmm. is per juvenile court judge uh they may have an answer to that but my guess even, is even they don't have an answer to that at this point given our system they may have an idea based on what they've looked at around the country is there um, any way to um to try to I guess accumulate that kind of data uh, to kind of see where the outliers are. Uh, and, and a lot of it's not only caseload, it's mm -hmm. the geographical area. Mm -hmm. It's the, the time um, that is spent on the road traveling from one county to another. Mm -hmm. So the caseload may be fairly small, but the time that it takes to actually sure. handle those caseloads are way out of proportion to what a single county circuit Got it. say yeah. would be. Okay. Thank you, Representative Reeves. 23. I'm sorry. Okay, Judge. Uh, Deborah, good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, too. Uh, I foresee the multiple camera circuits and interested in that part of it. Do you think that you understand that there really were different ways to divide up the cost between some of the circuits? Because in our circuit, there was still an interstate judge by population. Mm hmm. Some do it by population, some do it by caseload, uh, some do it on the fly. I mean, you know, it's done all, I, I get questions about judicial circuit budgets almost every day. They're not j just juvenile, but superior court, all of them, uh, because they're done in such a different variety of ways uh, that I, I am continually getting questions about judicial circuit budgets. So I think some of them are based on caseload and some are based on population. 
Thank you. Um, any other questions for Deborah? Okay. Thank Again, you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank today. you. I, I appreciate it. And I'll, I will certainly, um, and committee members, I encourage you, if you have, uh, if you would like in, uh, that data, please reach out to me or my assistant, um, and we'll make sure that we provide that to the committee members moving yeah, forward. We stand so ready to assist. I, I think that that would be very beneficial for us as we're, you know, move forward in establishing that baseline. So I appreciate it. Thank you thank so much. You. All right, the next we're going to hear, and I, I understand from uh, Eric, the, the director of our juvenile court judges, um, that we're going to hear from a couple of different folks from, from your organization. So feel free, you, you've got the podium. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. And just to answer Representative Reeves' question, a few, oh, or maybe five, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, the Ju uh, Justice for Children, it was called something differently at the time, did an assessment, and at that point, it was thought that 1,600 cases was what a full-time judge ought to be handling. What I know now, and I just received a text from Kirsten, who's my budget director and who keeps a lot of numbers, today the average is somewhere between 700 and 1,000 cases, and so a full-time judge is handling that. I imagine it's because of all the different changes in the law that requires their time. So that is the one thing we're trying to get a handle on because that is the question we get from many circuits is, you know, when should this judge go from part-time to full-time or should we appoint a part-time or a full-time judge? So we just come, we, we gather this information that's used that, but as Deborah said, there's so many factors, demographics, size of the county, how many counties in a circuit, and everybody just, kind of tailors their appointments based on what they think they need. So, and I mean, Deborah may disagree, she may agree. I, I think that our judges and the Superior Court judges have done an overall good job of appointing the right number of judges and the right makeup, part-time, full-time. I don't think there's any abuse of that um, at all. So some of our bigger circuits, I've been working with two to three juvenile court judges and they get assistance from associate judges, so. Um, but before I let any of the judges talk, I wanted to kind of give a little background history since I've been around since 95. When I first came to the council, the judges, the juvenile court judges were basically, and this will go more to the committee, the juvenile court judges were basically uh, appointed, were local county judges. A lot of them were in counties. They were appointed by local laws. They did not follow the state law, which had a population breakdown for salaries, and it, but it had that clause that it wouldn't be coming from the state until appropriated by the General Assembly, and to my knowledge, it never was appropriated under that population uh, bracket. We even had some judges that were serving different types of, uh, because of the statute, we had judges serving different time periods. We had some serving two years, because the Superior Court judge who appointed them at the time would say, well, I've, I've got two years left on my term, and I'm not gonna bind this judge to the other judge, so he would appoint him for two. We had one judge, athens Clark County, under a local law, he was being appointed for six years. So we really had a huge disparity in how all that was, but it was county. They were county, there were local laws that set the, the whole parameters. Uh, we had back then, and this was an old local constitutional amendment, we still have it to this day, we have one elected judge, and that's the judge in Floyd County. And that was done through an old local constitutional amendment, which then had a local act that set up that judgeship. And it's worked for them. They've been doing it, I believe it was sometime in the early to mid 80s when that got done. So, uh, so then we fast forward real quickly to 2000. There's an effort by the legislature to provide state fundings, and we went through many different um, variations of it. Eventually we came up with the current system that was 85,000 per circuit. Y'all raised it to 100,000 uh, two years ago with then additional money going to the circuit. So 85,000 per circuit automatically, not per judge, and then it would go up based on the number of superior court judges. Uh, so for every superior court judge over four, you would get a quarter more of 85 and so on and so on. So obviously Fulton County with 20 Superior Court judges or 18 at the time had the most money. We didn't have a way to get money to the rural areas that were never gonna have more than probably two Superior Court judges. So they were getting 85. 
So that's why 2016 was very important because by you just moving it up to 100,000, even though we were wishing to do it per judge, it did give some of your rural areas, I think anywhere from six to eight circuits, judges got raises because all they were getting paid is the 85,000. And now they've gone up to 100,000. And then some circuits with the increase have kicked in a little more. So some were making 105, 110. So had a lot of uh, judges who, who thanked me and thanked the legislators for it, you know, going up to 100,000 per circuit because it did give them a raise. So that's where we are today. Uh, I know Representative Welch, Representative Ballinger, and others are interested in how the formula, is it the best way? Can we do it differently? Should they be state employees? Should they, they be um, selected a different way? So that's the question we have. Um, that's where we are today. One quick thing, which I know Madam Chair is interested in, uh, somewhere in the early 2000s, there was language put in the code to require the advertisement for three months prior to an appointment in the local organs of the county that there was gonna be an appointment of a juvenile court judge. That came from uh, Renee Camp in Hinesville, Senator Renee Camp. He was upset that juvenile court judges and obviously his constituency, juvenile court judges were getting reappointed and nobody knew about it. And so he put that into the statute. And interesting enough, Cherokee County was the first judgeship that came up for reappointment under the new law and myself and Jackson Harris, Judge Harris kind of came up with an ad and it was basically a simple ad. It just said, notice is given that a juvenile court judge is gonna be appointed on such and such month. Eventually different uh, jurisdictions changed it uh, and, I, and some of the judges here will be able to talk about the difference way they do it. Some started using the ad as a mechanism for uh, inviting applications and made it a more formal process where people could apply and knew about the job and knew when it was gonna be appointed and applications were submitted. Fulton County, and I was hoping Judge Boyd would be here, he was supposed to come um, and he may still, Fulton County went a little further and they were actually asking from the community and the lawyers to provide input on the current judge and whether they he or she should be reappointed. And that was a new wrinkle that was added to the ad. So, uh, and then that's happening a lot more in some of your ads now where they're now asking for input and now they have more involvement uh, by the uh, community and by the lawyers in the appointment of the juvenile court. So we have moved a long ways from the ad and the upset that that senator was about how judges were being reappointed. And interesting enough, in that circuit, when the funding was provided in 2000, none of the judges that were serving in that circuit as juvenile court judges were appointed under the new funding scheme. Stream. It, three new judges were appointed. So obviously that had been something that was bothering the community and the legislators uh, about how the appointment was done. So that's sort of my preliminary remarks. And Thank you, do, um, uh, Commissioner Niles. Just a quick question, Eric. You mentioned and um, about the issue with the appointment of uh, judges at the local level concerning the match or the going from eighty-five to a hundred thousand. Was that on top of the supplement from the county level judges? So, what the way it basically starts off is they they get the state funding, everything they're entitled to. They come up with the salaries at some point, and that's decided by the Superior Court judges right. with the consent of the counties. Uh, that was important. They, that was in the original act, the consent of the counties. They decided to leave it in the act because they always felt like there was always that fear that somebody's going to appoint somebody part-time for $80,000, and the county's not going to be able to say anything about it. So they, they bring all the money in. They decide, you know, they know how many judges they have, how much they're getting paid, and then they dole out the state funding in different counties and pro rata shares sometimes, and then the counties then start to supplement in mm -hmm. to make up the salary. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Is, is that a system that we need to look at? In, in what regard? Like As it relates to, um, and I don't know if it's a fair statement, but a statement of which it's 
uh, shows transparency amongst the pay scale for judges? Well, that's a good question, and there, there is a lot of that. As a matter of fact, when this last funding occurred and the $100,000 was there uh, for the taking, no strings attached, there was a couple of circuits who did not want to use the money to give the judge a raise, but they were basically going to bring it in into the county funds yes. and use it to offset what the county was already mm -hmm. doing. But now uh, that was only for judges making more. Than right, right. And also for particular judges. <laughs> let's, let's, let's. Well, no, it was, for, <laughs> it was for judges making more, but there was a couple of cases where yes. the judge told me, Eric, I know I'm not getting the raise because it's going to put me above the state court judge or it's going to put me above the magistrate or too close to the spear court. So they, that's why they weren't doing it. And, of course, the fact that the community, the spear court judges, the counties felt that that judge was being compensated what they ought to be compensated. And so a lot of them didn't fight it. Some of them said, I, I understand, you know. So, yeah. So absolutely. that compression issues will be in effect of across the board for your superior court, your your magistrate judges, as well as the, the particular traffic court judges. Uh -huh. And that's why there's also been a hesitancy, even though it's done, to tie the juvenile court judge's salary to the superior court judges because then it automatically moves every time that one moves so and sometimes and i said i'll be the first to tell you the judges will say hey i'm getting paid what i think i i deserve to be paid i'm happy with that but it it, it was great to have y'all increase it to a hundred thousand because a lot of judges who are making 85 and judges that had five six counties making 85 only uh, I think the Oconee Circuit, the one in particular, went up to 100000 She was grateful. So, uh, Quickly to Deborah's point, somewhere along the line, I don't remember if it was in 2000, it may have been sometime after that when we were looking at doing COLAs for juvenile court judges, and this, I believe, was under the Purdue administration. We did a quick survey and asked how much the counties were putting in into the juvenile court system with salaries and everything, and at the time, and I believe it was under Purdue, the number we received, and it's not a very accurate, was that the counties together were putting in $51 million into the juvenile court system. And that was staffing, courtroom, and everything that goes with it. So we did want to show the legislature and the governor at the time that the counties were putting in a majority of the, the funding, less whatever the state was giving uh, at the time for the salaries. So. <laughs> I'm just curious, what do the counties contribute towards Superior Court? Because, uh, I mean, obviously the courtroom, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that they would obviously financially contribute for well, the, the Superior well, Court. Well, the numbers, so. what, 300, supposedly each judgeship is 300,000, and then well, whatever the basically. supplement is. I'm just curious. You know, like, uh, yeah, where, where parity is as far as what the, you know, where that responsibility lies. Uh, basically, um, the state is paying the judgeship and mm. separate parity. Okay. That's it. Mm. I, and a law clerk. Isn't there a law well, clerk? Some, some, some circuits do. get law clerks, some and don't. then some are county paid. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, everything else is on the county. So any additional staff, mm -hmm. additional prosecutors, additional public defenders, uh, drug court staff, all of those types of positions are paid for by the county. Now, we, you know, there is grant money for mm -hmm. accountability courts, obviously, but uh, at the end of the day, those are county-funded positions. And the counties are paying all of the insurance and retirement, all of those ancillary costs, those costs. I mean, the state's given a grant for juvenile court judges' salaries, but the counties are funding the retirement and health insurance and all of those other things. Mm -hmm. For the committee's information, Eric, um, do the um, juvenile court judges, do they avail themselves to the judicial retirement or not? Yes, in 1998, when the judicial, the three retirements, or the two retirement systems were merged, judicial retirement and the trial court and solicitor's retirement were merged into one, the judicial retirement system. Juvenile court judges, state court judges, obviously at the time superiors were already part of it, and I think DAs and solicitors were mandated to be part of the judicial retirement system. So okay. every one of my judges or our judges, um, since uh, appointed after 98, was mandated to be a member of the judicial retirement system. And there's some inequities in that because some counties have better retirement systems. Your big counties like Fulton, DeKalb, Gwinnett, um, they have better retirement systems. Uh, okay. So. All right. Thank you. I was just... 
And before I let the judges go real quickly about the funding, when we got the 2000 funding, we had 14 circuits who were using, uh, the Superior Court judges were exercising juvenile court jurisdiction. Some of those, because I know you mentioned this in one of the discussions, most of those were actually associate judges that the Superior Court judges were appointing um, to be the juvenile court judge, and a lot of them were their law clerks. So the intent of the 2000 funding, as Jim Martin and Larry Walker had envisioned, was to professionalize juvenile courts. Uh, immediately after that, all but one went to a juvenile court judge. And Agichi is still the only one that has Superior Court judges exercising jurisdiction, but we have been talking to them since the new bill passed, and I believe they're gonna go to a juvenile court judge in January. <laughs> and then we had five part-time positions that immediately went to full-time. So <laughs> there was, you know, there were some results. Uh, when I last talked to Representative Jim Martin, he had hoped that we had made more progress to full-time juvenile court judges in every juvenile court, but the demographics don't necessarily lend themselves to that. So. Okay. Um. Commissioner Niles? No, ma'am. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I switched. Oh, but I'm sorry. I, okay, Judge. I thought this was my mic, but this is it. It's, it's all good. Thank you. Eric, uh, do you have any figures on the number of juvenile court judges that are getting a county uh, match for the 7.5% for retirement? The, I think Kirsten has that. We've surveyed the judges <coughs> recently as uh, when we did our last seminar. We've started to pick up the many questions that y'all have been asking that we weren't asking, and that's one of them. Uh, so, because a lot of judges have told me, uh, my salary's still the same, but the counties are picking up my retirement and my health care, so they feel like that's a raise. Uh, Judge Jones in America <coughs> says they did that for her, and so the full amount goes to her salary, and uh, so she felt like I got a raise because they're taking care of that, and we're also, have also looked into how many judges, I know you're interested in this, how many of them are still doing superior court, um, how many times a month, how many times a week. So, so but in any, anything that you all want, we could incorporate into the survey because Kirsten's doing a good job of collecting all that data and putting it into a nice <laughs> chart. Uh, of information. Okay, all right, thank you, Judge. Representative Reeves. And on, on that, how many, do you, do y'all know how many circuits still have juvenile court judges presiding in superior court and that's decided locally right right, right. is that st is that practice um is it waning or is it still a, a pretty big practice it's still is that if she's handing you what i think it is which uh -huh. is the last survey i think what is it 22 circuits yeah that's right 22. but i think little by little it is uh becoming less uh what i've seen over the years when i first became director there was a group of juvenile court judges that were being appointed. There was a relationship between them and, and the Superior Court judges. And then the next wave that came in, there was a different relationship. And the, the last level that has been coming in lately, there seems to be more of an appreciation of the job that the juvenile court has mm -hmm. and the juvenile court judge has. And there seems to be less and less um, asking the juvenile court judge to come to Superior Court. Gotcha. So, Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. Um, Judge Wheeler. I don't know if I could address that quickly. Our, I'm one of two juvenile court judges. We're both full-time now. We have a regular superior court schedule six days per month at a minimum and then three weeks a year of misdemeanor trials. So I don't see that changing except they might give us more trial weeks. So Okay. All right. Thank you, Judge. Right. Uh, with that, some judges, Representative Reeves, some judges are only asked to do like custody and divorce if it rolls into a juvenile sure. case, but there's a lot of counties where they're coming in and doing criminal calendars and other cases. So. Thank you. All right. Who, who's next? I can let uh, Judge Boyd and maybe Judge Whitfield talk more about the okay. in s how things are done in with the selection of the judges. Okay. Judges. All, All right. right.
Thank you, Judge. I know who you are, obviously, but if you wouldn't mind, just briefly introduce yourself to the committee and tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about, and then you can get started. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Whitfield. Uh, I think many of you know now I am a senior juvenile court judge, uh, having recently uh, retired from the bench full time, but uh, uh, am available for judicial assistance under the uh, senior judge uh, provisions. Uh, was previously uh, president of our Council of Juvenile Court Judges. Uh, Judge Spivey is our current president of our council, and uh, I was on the bench in Cobb County. Uh, I think I'll let Judge Boyd talk a little bit about the selection. I'll answer any questions if you've got on that. I just wanted to mention a couple of things on the questions that your committee has already asked. Uh, caseload. Uh, I got into trouble uh, testifying uh, before your committee, I think using the term caseload when I was really meaning how many cases are on the calendar every day. Uh, in juvenile court, uh, we are really the only trial court where we, when we issue an order, we open the case and all the other trial courts, when they issue an order, they essentially are closing the case. So when we have a case, that's not the end of it. That's just the beginning of it. And we have multiple hearings in every case based on the statutory guidelines and the, and the new code revisions that Ms. Uh, Nesbitt mentioned briefly. Uh, we may have a, a removal order, we'll have a preliminary protective hearing order, we'll have an adjudication hearing, we'll have a dispositional placement hearing, we'll have a judicial review, we'll have a permanency plan review, all set by statute, all with statutory timelines on them. And every case starts out that way. And then by statute, they have to be reviewed on a certain time schedule. Anything that comes up in the middle, you know, a placement change that comes up, or some other type of judicial review that comes up. So one case may result in at least five hearings and many times more than that within the first six months. And then if a child remains in foster care for an extended period of time, then those hearing numbers just continue to, to add up on the dependency side. On the delinquency side, it's a little bit more intuitive. Uh, there's a charge. Uh, there may be a probable cause hearing, uh, an arraignment, trial, disposition, uh, but the, the number of reviews are not there the way they are in the dependency cases. So the delinquency side is a little bit more uh, intuitive about that. We recognize three years ago uh, when we approached the legislature with regard to uh, taking a look at the state grant funding for juvenile court judges, that part two of that was going to be how to figure out this caseload judge number. And there wasn't really an accurate mechanism out there to do that. Uh, we addressed that, I guess, a year ago by adopting an entirely new set of docketing guidelines so that we, as a class of court, could have some uniformity in how we count our cases and it takes into account these multiple hearings uh, it may be case number 1250 but then we've got a provision in our docketing guidelines to append to that a number that would reflect how many times this particular case has come on a calendar for some judicial review, involvement, hearing, ruling, or whatever it might be, so that we can try to calculate that. Uh, I have the same type of thing under the new statute with CHINs, Children in Need of Services, that added an entire different class of types of cases. <coughs> and they have multiple uh, reviews on them. So we're trying to get across the state, you know, a uniform so we can be looking at apples and apples when we try to look at this. And, and it, it, it is an elephant that we're trying to eat one bite at a time. Uh, it's taken some time to get that done. Uh, there will be some time to get it in place because as we've talked about the unique nature of our class of court across the state, every circuit, every county has sort of a different way of dealing with it. Uh, 
some courts have their own dedicated juvenile court clerk. Some courts rely on the superior court clerk. Uh, kind of hard for us to tell the superior court clerk, look, you got to do it this way when they say, no, we want to do it this other way. So, you know, we're, we're working with that, but I, we, th we think our docketing guidelines will now be able to hopefully capture, you know, the, an accurate number on what these caseload might be, and it's not just a case count. Uh, there may be some other work study uh, issues that have to be involved in that to, to determine, you know, what the weight might be placed on, for example, a termination of parental rights. Certainly it's going to take much longer than uh, a delinquent shoplifting case might take. So we've got to figure out some weighting averages there. And uh, the Superior Court, uh, Judicial Council, the AOC, you know, they have a formula when they're looking at Superior Court judges. It won't translate, but, you know, it might be a framework that, that could be looked at uh, as this committee goes forward with trying to determine how best to approach these issues. A uh, couple other things that came up. Uh, Eric mentioned uh, you, on a question with regard to the uh, judicial salaries, and I, I was talking with Mr. Scandalakis a little bit earlier, and, and when we talk about this, it's a little bit like somebody asking you what time is it, and I have to go into explaining how to build a clock. It is a complicated formula that is in the code. It takes more than one look at it before you can really start understanding how the statutory provisions calculate the straight state grant funding, how much it is uh, based on the number of Superior Court judges and so forth. But the state provides the $100,000 funding under the new uh, law that, that uh, we got a couple years ago, and we thank you for that. It has been a benefit uh, across the state. It is to be used for salaries, but we as individual juvenile court judges are not state employees, we're county employees. Under the statute, it provides that the superior court will establish the salary of a juvenile court judge subject to the consent of the governing authority. Of course, the Board of Commissioners has to write the check, so they've got to agree. But it's the superior court that determines how much the salary is. So as Commissioner Miles uh, Niles asked, you know, it's all over the place. You know, different circuits have different salaries. There is no uniformity to it. Uh, but that is a function of what the, the current statute is. Uh, I don't have an answer for you. It's something that this study committee is, is obviously looking at. Uh, but we are not paid the $100,000 and then we get a supplement from the county. It's a different setup than like the Superior Court judges who are state funded at that level, 126 or 132 based on if they have accountability courts and so forth. They get a check from the state and then their individual counties or circuits may supplement that. So they get a check from their county also. So some do, most do, some don't get anything but their state funding, just like juvenile court judges, they only would get the state grant. But we're not paid a supplement like the classic terminology for Superior Court judges is. And I know whenever their funding bill about four years ago uh, was passed, there were some restrictions with regard to how those supplements can be and they froze them at some levels and dealing with it because, you know, it, it was not a system that the legislature found very palatable, uh, I think. Uh, but we're not a supplement. We're paid by the county. Our salary is determined by whatever is set by the <coughs> judge. What is the salary? What, what is the range? You know, like, obviously, the lowest paid full-time juvenile court judge would get 100000 What is the high end? Do you know what the, the very highest end is? <coughs> More than likely, it's going to be whatever the highest, and we can get this number. Whatever the highest salary of a superior court superior. judge is, there's going to that's be over two hundred thousand. There's going to be a couple of judges that are getting ninety, 
percent because yeah. they've done it through a local. Savannah Chatham County has the highest paid Superior Court judges, and they were right at two hundred thousand. Right. So that they would be getting basically one hundred and eighty. So there would almost be a hundred percent difference between the lowest paid to the highest paid. Okay. And that, and that is some you know that's determined locally, and 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 some of them are just set at a percentage of, mm -hmm. so they don't have to deal with you know if if Superior gets a bump. You know, in their supplement state funding, then juvenile court would just bootstrap up. But it causes this uh, trickle down effect that, you know, okay, you got state court, you got magistrate court, you got probate court, you got juvenile court, you know, where, where does everybody fall in the pecking order locally? Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, there, there's a lot of different pressures on that. But yes, there is a big range. Okay. Big um, range. Judge, judge. Yeah. Uh, Judge Whitfield, the 90 percent, uh, do you know how many circuits that that Superior Court fee order, or rather salary order, is 90 percent of the Superior Court judge's salaries? It, you know, is I, it a large number of circuits, or is it? No, I, I think it's going to be a very small number of circuits that are tied to Superior Court. Okay. It's a very small, probably single digits, you know, maybe, maybe five or less even. Uh, but there, uh, there are a few that are tied, and so that's what takes them, uh, takes them up on that upper range. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to just mention with regard to uh, some questions about the <coughs> retirement. Uh, when the statute changed uh, in 2000, those folks that were not kind of grandfathered in and had an option, you know, the way it is right now, a juvenile court judge uh, has to be in the judicial retirement system by statute and by statute cannot participate in a local county retirement. So it's the only option that we have. And I'm not, I'm not complaining about that, okay? Having now crossed over to that side, I'm not complaining about that. Uh, but we cannot be in the county retirement system also. Now, uh, Judge Spivey, I think, uh, asked this question. Under the statute also, the county can reimburse a juvenile court judge for their judicial retirement contribution. So it would come out as just a benefit, an employee benefit uh, for reimbursement of that. And that is specifically provided for in, st in the statute uh, with regard to that reimbursement part. But they're not required to. That's something that you just have to work out on a local level with superior court judges and then the county commissioners in order to do that okay all right commissioner as it relates to you mentioned the the various demands that put on the juvenile court judges um, for various reasons like dealing with the chins cases and delinquency uh, and and uh, parental rights so forth and so on that demand for that office has grown tremendously, uh, but the salary has not. The, the first change in almost 17 years was a couple years ago when the legislature increased it from the 85 to the 100. That was the first change of any state level funding you know, since, since the 2000 uh, code. And just one other quick, uh, judicial assistance in the Superior Court. I know Representative Reeves from Cobb County kind of knows, you know, how it worked in Cobb County for many years. Uh, I would assist essentially one week out of every month mm -hmm. in Superior Court, and all of the other juvenile court judges would do the same. Uh, that has changed. It, it, you know, that's the way it was in the past and was stable that way for, for 10 years or longer. Uh, and then that's, that changed a little bit. The, the number of weeks uh, were reduced. Uh, when I was presiding judge in, in Cobb, I went to our Superior Court and said, we can't do this anymore. The new code has put additional obligations on us that we cannot commit to you that much time. And they, they heard the message. And so it reduced down, and, uh, and it continued to drop down a little bit. And I, I think currently, right now, uh, 
Superior Court is not using juvenile court judges for judicial assistance. And, you know, there may have been a lot of other dynamics involved in that, but uh, in some places, uh, like Judge Wheeler indicated, you know, it, it, it's still a uh, fairly regular practice, but I think overall the state, the trend has probably gone down because as juvenile court judges, we've all gone to our superior court judges and said, we, we can't do this anymore. We can't offer up that time because we can't double up. Our days are already long and many times I was on the bench till way after five o'clock just to finish that day's calendar because the next day was gonna be the same. You know, in the past if we had, you know, a day that finished at three o'clock or something, and you know, you could kind of work around and add some extra cases and, and, and still be able to offer the judicial assistance. But I think across the state our judges have gone to their superior court judges and, and indicated the additional burdens have have limited our ability to do that. And by and large, I think they've been receptive of that message. All right. Thank you, Judge. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I will remind you, just kind of, we have a lot of people that are watching online, so that's why the, the microphones, because I know, you know, I've got a big mouth and I'm pretty loud, so, um, you know, everybody can kind of hear me, but, you know, whenever we're transmitting this on the line, I know um, Judge Harris, who couldn't be here, he's traveling out of state, is actually watching, um, and, um, you know, I know uh, Chairman Welch is also going to be catching up. He had an, an appropriations committee retreat um, that he's at, so he was unable to attend, so I just wanted to kind of remind you um, that you know it is important for those that aren't here thank you judge over you i'm you reminding can. folks all the time in my courtroom to speak in the microphone i'm brad boyd i'm a judge at the juvenile court in fulton county i'm old enough to be a senior judge but i'm not there yet um i'm one of seven judges in the court um as you know the superior court judges appoint judges of the juvenile court we have three such judges that are appointed by the Superior Court, and then we have four associate judges. Those judges, um, associate judges are appointed by the chief judge of the juvenile court. And for some number of years, we have essentially accommodated our caseload by the use of um, associate judges, and historically I've had more associate judges than judges. Um, I During the um, period of time I was uh, chief judge for five years and during that time I had the opportunity to appoint three associate judges one of which was subsequently appointed as judge um, and then I appointed um, the successor to uh, Judge Turner. Uh, I was asked to s talk a little bit about the selection process for judges in, in Fulton County um, and I think that the how judges are identified, selected, and appointed probably varies across the state except for the fact that Superior Court judges do that appointment. Um, when I was appointed uh, about nine years ago as, uh, pr as, a, as a judge, I had previously been an associate judge, there was put in place at that time a process that I don't think had been used before, which essentially was the creation of a kind of search committee the Superior Court um, app uh, appointed two individuals to serve as chairs, co-chairs of a committee. They were asked to then fill out that committee with other uh, folks who had stakeholders and other folks who had an interest in and involvement with the juvenile court and, and some background and expertise in the practices and, and cases that go through there. That. Um, the position was then advertised and anyone uh, interested in uh, seeking an appointment as a juvenile court judge was asked to submit their application to the chairs of that committee. Actually, I think the, um, the actual letters of application went through the court administrator for Superior Court, but they were forwarded to that committee. That committee then went through the various resumes and applications and uh, chose um, a list of folks to um, a list of folks to uh, interview. From those interviews, uh, a short list was created and provided to the Superior Court judges. So the Superior Court judges then had um, <coughs> uh, a relatively short list of 
candidates that this committee had sort of vetted and looked at and interviewed um, so that they had felt that they had folks that were qualified uh, by experience to uh, serve in that capacity. I think uh, some of the rationale behind that was that there are 20 judges in the Superior Court in Fulton County and um, from previous uh, appointments that had gone through, I think none of them looked forward to the kind of constant lobbying and phone calls and letters that were being directed to all 20 of those judges and they felt that uh, it would be better to have a more um, a vetting process that was a little more attuned to uh, looking at folks' experience and so on. I was the first judge that was appointed from that uh, kind of process. And since my appointment, there have been three other appointments um, of, of judges appointed by the Superior Court. All of them went through that same process. And the fact that it has been repeated after uh, being initiated uh, for my appointment about nine years ago, I think, reflects the fact that uh, the Superior Court judges seem pleased with, with the way that works and the candidates that that uh, arose from that, that process. The um, appointment of associate judges in the county, when those vacancies have come up, um, have pretty much followed that same practice. And uh, that was sort of voluntarily set up when we had uh, vacancies in the um, juvenile court. Uh, when I was a chief judge, we set up a similar process of having uh, folks look at um, the applicants coming in, make some recommendations, and then all the judges um, would get together, that all three of the judges that were appointed by the Superior Court would get together and um, interview the candidates that, uh, that were forwarded to us. Uh, the last time that, that that happened, it was a more abbreviated process because what had happened was one of the associate judges that I had previously appointed was appointed by the uh, by the Superior Court to be a judge, and um, we looked uh, at that time we looked at the um, lists of folks that had been on the short list for that uh, appointment before the Superior Court, as well as others that had already been um, had submitted applications for previous appointments, and we didn't sort of open the whole thing up again. We sort of looked at that population and appointed. Uh, from that. But in a sense, uh, I mean essentially, we've had a, a similar process happen at both the appointment by the Superior Court and the Associate Judge appointments in the Juvenile Court. And I don't know if, I don't know if that's been replicated other places or not. I know it's been, it's been looked at. Um, so any questions? The, the the committee that the judges um, is who who specifically makes the appointment um, by statute is it the chief chief superior court judge or is well, it in in it's a, it's all the judges so in in Fulton County mm -hmm. twenty judges eleven judges would make that appointment okay so it's a majority it's of a majority of, of okay all right now who who appoints the committee. Is the, is that is that governed by statute? I mean, does DJJ get a voice? Or, you know, does it's not governed by statute. Okay. It's just uh, the and I don't even. I, <laughs> I, Thank you, Commissioner. I, Unbiased I opinion. <laughs> I don't even remember who was on that committee. I just remember going in for an interview and seeing lots of folks. Yeah, <laughs> most of whom I knew or mm. had, uh, who had, uh, you know, either practiced in the court or were involved with, you know, folks from DFACS. Uh, Commissioner, I don't remember if DJJ had anyone there or not, but um, the district attorneys and the and the uh, defense uh, attorneys, um, child welfare um, organizations, uh, I believe the Barton Center from Emory, um, there were, I think the, the, they're ahead of the, there, there was an appointment from the uh, advocacy, Child Advocacy Committee for the State Bar. Um, there were probably a dozen folks in there that were doing the interview. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, you have a quick question? Uh, I can if you want. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, that, that was Judge Spivey. Just, I have a good question here. What, who, the two co-chairs actually were able to fill out the co They actually created the committee. And, the, the and, and two, who, were they Superior Court judges? No. 
um, neither was a, neither was a judge. The, ju the, the judges of the Superior Court chose it. I, and I honestly don't know if that was sort of, if that came from the chief judge, if that came from the juvenile court committee of, of the Superior Court. I, I doubt if it was all 20 judges, but they were, those two persons, and those were two people that had long been involved in all kinds of, uh, of issues regarding juvenile court. Terry Walsh from uh, Alston and Bird, and um, uh, Kim Anderson, who uh, at, I think was on the board of Home Depot at the time, but it also I think was a chair of uh, Families First. Um, they then they then sort of looked about the community and said, "These are the folks that we would like to have on the committee." Um, they created the committee. Okay. Um, can you speak a little bit about how your associate judgeships are created? I mean, do you kind of, you know, sit around and go, wow, we've got an extra office over there. Let's, let's give Bob a job. You know, well, obviously that's not what you do, but you know. we need the money to pay for them. Yes. And I will say that we have seven judges mm -hmm. and all of us are pretty much in court every day. Uh, and associate judges with very few exceptions, um, handle the same caseload as, as, uh, all, as, as the judges appointed by the Superior Court. They get paid a lot less. Now I know in DeKalb County, recently, uh, they, the Superior Court made all their associate judges into appointed judges. And we have raised that issue in Fulton County because frankly it seems to be a bit unfair that we're, we've got two classes of judges who are doing the same work. Um, that whose who's pay disparity is significant. Mm -hmm. um, and that the pay for them is, is set by the county. Okay. So the associate, the, the creation of an associate judgeship would just be dependent on appropriations, basically. Right. In, 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 in your case in Fulton County. Right. Um, so if you decided to appoint, we'll say Eric, to a judgeship and the county said, no, you know, we're not going to pay him, then he, he doesn't get to then. <laughs> Uh, n right. I mean, okay. We, and, and we do, uh, we have one, one part-time associate judge that's appointed who gets paid on a kind of per diem basis when they get called in to help. Okay. Can you speak a little bit about the infrastructure that you have to have to support a judgeship, whether it's law clerk, secretary, office, that sort of thing? Well, and, ag and again, our associate judges and our judges have basically the same support system. We have an office. There's a judicial assistant who's the, the administrative assistant for the office. Um, there is a calendar clerk. Um, there are, now the sheriff's department provides deputies as, as bailiffs for all of them. There's a courtroom for each judge. We do have a pairing. Each judge uh, is paired with an associate judge and we share uh, a law clerk. So we have uh, three law clerks that are each of each of us serve each of which serves two judges one judge and one associate judge the seventh associate judge who is usually usually the least senior um, is um, not paired with um, any w with one of the judges because they they handle a lot of a lot of the kinds of cases that you know, preliminary hearings traffic cases uh, chins cases the cases that are, are sort of unique uh, in, in their own right. Uh, we do have a, a way of allocating work between the associate judges and the, and the appointed judges. Uh, each is paired together with a team and while one judge is hearing a delinquency calendar one week, the other judge is hearing a dependency calendar, the next week it switches. So cases are assigned to a team and then you go to the judge that's hearing the case, that the, the kind of cases that are appropriate for that case when it comes in. Okay, all right, thank you, uh, Commissioner. So Madam Chair, if I could ask, uh, dive just a little deeper into what Madam Chair talked about concerning the appointment of those particular associate judge. What's the tenure as it relates to their particular um, years uh, practicing and or their experience in the juvenile um, arena. You mean prior, the, the kind of qualifications they bring to the application? Yes, sir. And then their, their particular, how does one go from a, a, a direct um, 
appointed position to a full-blown employee of the county? Well, the, the um, answer to your last question first, the associate judges are all county employees. Okay. Paid solely with county funds uh, and participate in the county pension system. Um, the qualifications for an associate judge would be the same as for an appointed judge in terms of residence and, and uh, practice. Um, other than that, it's pretty much up to the discretion of the chief judge and if it's, if a process is set up for a committee or some such. As, as a follow-up to that, do you see that or have you experienced that as a uh, judge that's just coming out of law school as a benchmark as it relates to practicing and then going into that the full-time position? Is that well, – I know the demand yeah. for, for those judges are <coughs> tremendous. We're not, we would not be likely to appoint a, a recent law school graduate as associate judge. We weren't likely, in, in fact, where the associate judges have come from, uh, for us, have been those who have practiced in the juvenile court system or have some significant experience and are very familiar with the, with the juvenile court system. We, um, we don't appoint part-time associates to, because anyone who's, who's going to be functioning in that capacity then cannot practice in the court, but um, those kinds of experiences, I mean, th those kind of qualifications, including their experience, is gonna be what's weighed by the chief judge or the committee uh, to sort of say, these are folks that really know the system and they're the folks that are, we ought to be have on the bench. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you, Judge. Could I supplement his comments real quick because there's some good information. Um, sure. In Fulton County, um, when I first became director and for a couple of subsequent years, they were appointing people to be judges that had never really practiced in juvenile court. I think they were coming from the corporate world, three of them in a row. Um, <coughs> eventually, when they got into the new system, they started to appoint people like Judge Boyd, who'd done many things in juvenile court. They started to appoint associate judges to be the judges. Um, so that that seems to be a good benchmark system to look at uh, just based on what I've seen in, since I became director. Okay. Uh, associate judges were referees originally. They didn't even have to be lawyers. And then eventually, and then you had two things you could, some of them would remember this, they were appealable within five days of making a decision. Their decisions had to be checked off and second signed by the juvenile court judge, even if they weren't, they were, it was just based on the paperwork. And eventually it was Judge Jones, who was one of his colleagues, um, who started to change the laws so he got rid of the signature. Because he said, these guys are doing what we're doing, I don't, and they're qualified. I don't have to be signing off, and so they, we took that restriction out. Then we took out the restriction about appeal on five days. And I think the last one we did is we now make associate judges have to have the same criteria to be appointed judge, which is at least five years of practice. So, okay, can you speak just a little bit? We'll say I'm a I'm, I, I get appointed. I'm Jan. Um, so we'll say that you know I'm I'm a juvenile court judge in Cherokee County. How is there any limitation other than funding on me appointing someone a, an associate juvenile court judge? No, just the funding. In some areas, courtroom space or staff, they're lucky because they have a beautiful complex and uh, but in the old court didn't some of the associate judges have to share offices like in the original Fulton County that was by the stadium they had to, so with the limitation is salary and then space and whatever else is going to be needed for that associate to have a hearing and to have recording and this the, the court people the, the parties and all that okay all right thank you any other questions all right Thank you, committee. Um, Department of Juvenile Justice. Madam Chair, if I could, while they're coming up. Um, Commissioner, you're an unbiased person, but we'd love to hear from you. Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair, <laughs> thank you. We have, um, of course, three of our um, members that's gonna give an overview of, and we wanted to give the committee a relationship as it relates to 
Um, um, you heard earlier the impact that some of the public safety people are having with people coming and going um, and talking about the youth that's returning back out in the community. So we wanted to give an overview of, of the agencies um, or our agency as it relates to the workmanship with um, the judges, the judicial branch of the uh, government. Um, three members with us today. Joe Vignati was started off. Um, Joe has, he's my chief of staff, uh, and all of us know Joe. He has direct oversight of, of our secure facilities, as well as you see Sean Hamilton, who has direct oversight of our community service, and then Katina Martin Finner, who's the deputy commissioner, who the judge is familiar with, her people that's working closest to the um, particular bench there in the courts. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Joe Vignati. Okay, all right, you have the floor. Madam Chair, uh, distinguished committee members, I was going to start my remarks by good morning, but it's actually afternoon now, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Joe Vignati, and I'm pleased to be here. Uh, we have a PowerPoint, which I'm going to try to get up on the screen, but it's also in your handouts as well, uh, and we're going to move through that. Uh, as Commissioner Nell said, this is a, a brief overview of how the work that DJJ does intersects with the work of the juvenile court judges. Uh, and as Commissioner Niles referenced, uh, we take what the judges give us and try to enforce the orders that they provide us with the youth that come to our door. Uh, so with that, uh, and I'm not sure how to get this screen going, ma'am. <coughs> okay. Yeah, the computer's okay. on. It's on. And so do I need to do this or? Mm. It was. It was. Oh. No. What? Uh oh. <laughs> no, Matt's doing that. Oh, okay. It's on the computer. I don't know why it's not up there. How did the projector come up? Okay. Oh, okay. It's rebooting. Okay. Okay, success. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am and Matt. <laughs> Team effort. It's, it takes a All right. Uh, our assistant commissioner, Sean Hamilton, is going to give an overview of the department. Very brief. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, we recognize that. Hold on. Come out. Where is your mic? Yeah, where is it? Is it a mic there on the table? No, or no there's a cord that does not have a mic on, <laughs> okay. on the floor. Um, Can one of these mics plug in? Uh, no, it doesn't. No, it not. doesn't work that way. Um, or he can stand up at the podium. Would you mind to stand at the podium? And I, I will insist. Kind of. We unfortunately we have to do that just because we have the uh, you know folks watching um, online and for posterity if anyone wants to uh, view the tape later, um, so they will know that they'll be able to hear you. Okay, so we'll be doing a little bit of shuffling through the presentation. So we recognize that um, public safety is our uh, biggest responsibility, and that is to protect all of the citizens of Georgia and to hold all youthful offenders accountable. And our primary goal with our young people is to ensure that when they leave us, they're better than when they came, and they leave us uh, as productive law-abiding citizens. In your packet, you have a map, and it looks, looks like this, and that's what I'm going to reference next. So we have 26 secure facilities, 
And of those 26 secure facilities, 19 um, are our short-term detention centers, and those are designated by the red circle. Uh, it says RYDC. We also have seven long-term facilities, um, and that is where um, our uh, young people serve out of uh, the bulk of their time, and that is designated by the blue circle, and it says YDC. We also have 95 uh, community offices around the state, and so we are represented in just about uh, most of the counties in the state of Georgia, and on any given day, uh, we provide supervision for over 10,000 uh, young people in our system. Good afternoon. Oh, let me pull this down, sorry. Good afternoon. In the past six years of enhanced cooperation between DJJ and juvenile court judges has led to the following juvenile system improvements. The development and implementation of the statewide juvenile assessment instruments, appropriate <laughs> interventions based on the risk and need, and improved evidence-based interventions and system improvements. I also would like to mention the enhanced cooperation that has provided opportunities for us to attend the judges conferences. We have improved our relationships and communication by our staff and court personnel participating in meetings that involves community partners such as the LIPT which is the local interagency planning team, stakeholder meetings, CHINs, and also DRT, which is the detention review team meetings. And to give an example of a DRT, what happens, the judge and along with court personnel and DJJ staff actually sit down and go over every youth that may be awaiting adjudication or disposition. And they decide at that time what will happen when the child comes back to court, if the child needs a psychological evaluation, what type of services that that youth may need at that time. And also, we have open dialogue with our judges. When our DJJ staff actually meet with the judges to actually discuss our operation as it relates to policies and procedures. And that helps also with the decision making for our youth as it relates to treatment and services. We have started having open houses. And what those open houses, we're actually inviting local law enforcement, community partners, um, school superintendent, um, basically reintroducing ourselves so that we can straighten those relationships because we do have new judges as well as we have new staff. So we want to make sure that we're all on the same page as it relates to providing those services. The judges, the DJJ and juvenile system partners work cooperatively to develop and implement assessments validated for the Georgia's youth, which is the detention assessment instrument, which is the DAI, the predisposition risk assessment, which is the PDRA, and the juvenile needs assessment. The development of these tools has been the platform for change in how we provide supervision, treatment, and services for youth. It allows a more objectiveness and unprejudiced decision making with juvenile cases across the state. It provides uniformity in how we operate as a system for change for our youth. The DAI, the judges have the ability to override if there are mitigating factors involving a case to make the appropriate decision. An example would be if there's a youth that needs to be released to a parent, but there's no parent to release the youth. And if DFATS is not available to actually take in the youth, we may have to detain that youth until we have a preliminary hearing to discuss where this child may need to be released to. The PDRA also provides the level of supervision for our youth um, as it relates to being a low risk, medium, or high. And that determines the standard of contacts that our probation officers has to make with the youth and families to include the community, to include schools, and also to include home visits for those youth. The JNA is the needs, and, the needs and Services Assessment. That basically drives the type of services, the type of treatment um, that the youth may need. And this tool is individualized. So it's not a cook and cutter 
type of situation that every youth that comes in will receive the same service and the same treatment. It will be based on that youth and that family. Okay, now I'm going to step away. So with the passage of House Bill <clears throat> 242, state and federal funds have really focused on us using more and more evidence-based programs. And I think we all know that uh, evidence-based programs are programs that have uh, research behind them and they've been shown uh, and proven to be effective uh, in long-term lasting outcomes for young people, uh, and particularly the population of young people that we serve. Some of those um, evidence-based programs that we use include uh, MST or multi-systemic uh, therapy, uh, FFT, which is functional family therapy, uh, T for C, which is thinking for a change, uh, ART, which is aggression, replacement therapy, and also seven challenges. And on any given day, we are always um, looking around the country for new evidence-based practices uh, to fold into um, our continuum of care. Um, we have a host of uh, licensed clinicians, psychologists, and psychiatrists around the state that help us uh, to do that research so that we can continue to move the needle forward with the services that we're providing. And so with the passage of HB 242 and criminal reform, criminal justice reform and juvenile justice reform, um, what we noticed, uh, as Sean talked about these different interventions, we did not necessarily have these interventions available across our state. So uh, we had to work with the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, who are here as well, uh, to offer up juvenile incentive grants. And there is a copy of a handout in your folder uh, that shows the impact of the juvenile incentive grants. Uh, those were offered to the top 20 committing counties, uh, and each county would get funds from the state a little over a million dollars in federal funds, and uh, I think it's about seven to eight million dollar in state funds now uh, that's provided to those courts for these evidence-based proven interventions that work with this population. Uh, and let me show you, uh, over 7,500 youth since 2014 have received these services. And these are services in lieu of detention or commitment to the department. Uh, and while these are not the magic bullet, that means that these don't work for every youth. We, they're not 100% successful, nothing is. However, they have been shown to be much more effective than not doing anything or just detaining youth or probating youth uh, or just commitment. Uh, so these are the types of services that work with families. Uh, they go into the homes, uh, they get to the root of the problem. Uh, so we're very excited to be able to offer those. And it's made a difference in the state. Uh, and Katina's gonna talk a little bit about some other system of improvements that relate to uh, DJJ and juvenile court. The juvenile interstate compact, sorry, joking. <laughs> the um, juvenile interstate compact is basically a contract that we have a joint cooperative action between the states that regulates the movement of youth from the state going across the state lines that may be under court supervision or aftercare to include any youth that may run, uh, run away without permission. The Interstate Commission for <coughs> Juveniles governs the compacting states. Um, we often have annual meetings, and these, at these meetings we actually discuss rules, if rules needs to be changed or voted on, and we did that on last year with voting of rules. We actually have training any enhancements for their juvenile tracking system that's the time that they actually bring those things up and certain states may have issues that they may be experiencing in their area and to kind of talk with other areas to see how they actually um, deal with those situations so it's more of a network and communication to kind of work through those issues we also have um, the travel permits and i just want to give an example any youth that decide to want to go visit, we'll just say Thanksgiving holidays, with a grandparent out of the state. We have to actually complete a travel permit that has to be signed by that parent and child, and we have to send it to that other state to say, hey, that we will have Johnny in your state for 
a week or two for Thanksgiving holidays, just in case if something happened, if we need them to reach out and say, hey, can you please go do a home visit? Um, just to make sure that he's complying. And that's what the connection is that we have with those states. And they will actually go out and do that home visit and report back to us. I also wanted to kind of mention the surveillance. Those youth that are actually, um, that may run here from another state, we have to return those kids back. And we have been noted, Georgia has been noted um, to do a fantastic job as it relates to surveillance for those youth. What happens, we provide um, transportation for the youth to the airport and we also send a security staff to actually transport that youth back to the other state and a lot of states don't have that so they brag about the surveillance that we provide for those youth to getting their youth back to them and right now I just want to mention to you we've had <coughs> 227 youth from other states right now in our state that we're supervising for them Outgoing, we have 188 youth of our youth that actually relocated to another state and they're actually providing supervision for us. And they provide progress notes every three months and it's both ends. We send those progress notes to inform them how the youth are doing and we would like to request that the case be terminated because this kid has been doing well for a year. He's in college, he's working. Those are the things that we want to be able to provide to them. So that'll be one less youth that we have to provi um, provide supervision for. So right now, we have um, a total of 409 referrals, and that includes the incoming and the outcoming of those youth. And also, one of the examples I want to mention to you about a sex offender. A sex offender here in Georgia, do not, they don't have to register for the sex offender register. But if that youth and parent decide to relocate to South Carolina, guess what? They have to register that youth as a sex offender. And that youth becomes on the register, and you're on there for life. So, so those are the, some of the things that we have to make sure that we're communicating uh, with those parents when they decide to make decisions like that because it may impact the child's future. Um, the juvenile data has changed. The juvenile data um, in Georgia currently resides in various systems that do not integrate. And that the banner, the JTS and JCATS and et cetera. But however, now we have a statewide juvenile justice data system that is designed to allow appropriate judicial and more informed legal advocacy to ensure that each youth receives justice throughout the state. The JDAX brings together committed partners from the governor's office, the Council of Juvenile Court Judges, and the Administrative Office of Courts, and the Department of Juvenile Justice to create this statewide data repository uh, for the juvenile justice data. The direct access to this system will be fully coordinated by the Judicial Council and the Administrative Office of Courts. And so really the bottom line in closing is that we know that juvenile justice reform in Georgia, it is in fact working. Um, and we know that because fewer kids are penetrating the deepest end of our continuum. Fewer kids are in our detention centers, and that is because more kids are being served on the front end who are low and moderate risk. Um, and those kids are being kept um, intact with their families. The new challenge for us, though, is really dealing with those deepest end offenders, and that is what we um, see in our secure facilities now. And those are kids um, who pose quite a challenge for us to deal with, but we're working uh, towards uh, putting uh, more services and supports uh, in place for them. These are kids who have experienced extreme and severe trauma unlike most of us will ever know. These are kids who uh, have experienced a tremendous amount of deprivation. These are kids often with low cognitive functioning. Uh, these are often kids who fall on our mental health caseloads. Um, and at one point in time, just a few years ago, our mental health caseloads are kids who had an AXIS-1 diagnosis. Uh, the percentage of those kids was probably somewhere just above 50%. We've been looking at metrics and data, and though we've not validated the new numbers, we think that that number might be approaching or maybe has even slightly exceeded maybe 70%. Uh, uh, in addition to that, 
we have a large number of our population now uh, who is gang involved in the community and also in our facilities. So that poses a huge challenge. But we know we're moving in the right direction and the glass is half full. And but for the support of our judiciary, um, of Governor Deal and this current administration, of our law enforcement uh, partners, of our legislature, uh, the um, cause that we're all fighting for uh, in terms of trying to turn the lives around of these young people or help them turn their lives around, we would not be as far down the road um, if, if it were not for these partnerships uh, and, of course, all of our partners in the community. So that was our presentation uh, this morning, but if you have any questions for us, uh, we would definitely like to uh, entertain those questions now. I appreciate that. That was an awesome presentation. Do the committee members have any questions? Um, Jiminy. Can you speak a little bit about the JDEX and the communication between the juvenile court judges about um, kids that are coming through the system, especially yes. those who are getting near that mm -hmm. deep end? And I'll take this over because this has kind of been a pet project since <laughs> I started in the state. Uh, I've been in juvenile justice almost 32 years. And as we talked about independent courts and dependent courts, you have courts and counties that have different data systems. So a superior court may have a, a data system like Banner and all the courts in that county have to use that. Well, that doesn't help when we're trying to talk to another court and find out. So we, we used to have an issue where kids uh, from one county would end up in another county, so Fulton to DeKalb, and not know that there was a case open in the other county. So you would have a, an instance where that youth would then possibly be put on probation or have the case transferred back to the home county, and then they would find, lo and behold, this youth's already on supervision. Where that youth might have been released, or was released, that youth would have been detained and probably uh, face a more stiffer penalty. So what, what we have now is what, what we would kind of term a GCIC for juveniles, where you'll have a complete legal history you'll have all the charges and it gives access to the judges uh, to look at that to see and court appropriate cor court personnel to see what that record of a juvenile is. Uh, so, you know, if some youth from South Georgia comes up and is on probation in Atlanta and does something, the court will be able to find that information out and be able to handle it appropriately. Okay. So does that kind of help answer that? Yeah, and, and we've rolled out the pilot uh, through 20 courts, and I know that uh, AOC is working on that, uh, and it should be uh, statewide pretty soon. So it, it's a big boon for Georgia. Um, and, and just as a personal anecdote, it, it helps in the fairness and application of justice across the state. When I first started, if you were in South Georgia and you stole two cars, you were going to Milledgeville YDC for two years, whereas if you were in Fulton County and you stole two cars, you, you got put on probation. Uh, so that, uh, us having a system that everybody knows the information and we all handle it and apply it the same way increases the fairness of our system and, and, and it's a great thing for our state. Okay, thank you. Uh, Judge Bybee. Madam Chair, Joe, I just want to thank you and all of the po people, Judge Price in particular, uh, from our council who have put in an immense amount of work on this. Sure. This too will be invaluable and, and we just look forward to it being rolled out, I, I believe January 1st, is that right? Yes, sir, yeah. that, that's the plan uh, yeah. to comport well, with, the, with the House bill that requires that. Well, I just want to thank you all for doing that. It's gonna be a great too. Well, I, I do have to mention Judge Lovett who was Fulton, with Fulton County, right. he, he spearheaded that, and, and we would not have been able to get that uh, going without Judge Lovett. And then also Judge Price took over on the passing of Judge Lovett, and Judge Price has done a, an excellent job to get us where we need to be, and, right. and we would not be there w without those two gentlemen. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else on the committee have any questions for the Department of Juvenile Justice? Okay, all right, I, I appreciate everybody for coming out today. Um, we are um, gonna probably have another meeting or two of the study committee, um, and we look forward to hearing from more community partners and some folks from across the country. If any committee members have any comments or questions, please feel free to let me know, but we are adjourned. <laughs>